here we go. Good evening and welcome to tonight's meeting of the Fort Wayne Community Schools Board of Trustees. Um, just a reminder that uh, this meeting um, is open to the public uh, following uh, uh, social distancing guidelines, uh, masks required, as is the case on all Fort Wayne Community School property. Um, so we're limited in the uh, members of the public that we can have here. Uh, and a reminder that you can watch this meeting on cable, Comcast 54, or Frontier 24, um, live stream on our Facebook page, um, or the Fort Wayne Community School YouTube channel. Um, so we begin, as we do each meeting, with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, now, normally, right now, we would do roll call of members, but um, first, we need to swear in our newest member from District 4, uh, Raleigh Booker. So we'll do that first, and then we'll have our roll call of members. So probably have you stand, probably have you stand, stand yep. Please. And that will be administered by the clerk of the board, Janet Doherty. I solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States of America, the Constitution of the State of Indiana, and the laws of the United States and the State of Indiana. I will faithfully execute the duties of my office. I will faithfully execute the duties of my office as a member of this governing body. So as help me God. As a member of this governing body, so help me God. Congratulations. Thank you, Janet. And now we will have. Uh, roll call of members. Steve? Good evening, Steve Corona from the 5th District. Good evening, Tom Smith, 3rd District. Ann, oh, I'm sorry. Ann Duff, member at large. Maria Norman, member at large. Riley Booker, 4th District. And I'm Julie Hollingsworth, uh, elected from District 1. And also with us this evening is the Clerk of the Board, Janet Doherty, whom you just saw and our superintendent, Dr. Mark Daniel. Good evening. Um, so it's been a while since we have had um, awards and recognitions, but uh, we have one this evening. Um, so, oh. We'll wait until. I think they're still outside waiting. <laughs> Probably out there getting warmed up in the big event. Stretching. Yep, stretching. <laughs> okay, so it's recommended that the board recognize Northrop High School class of 2020 graduate, Tiana Brown, for being named the 2020 Miss Indiana Track and Field. Tiana Brown placed at state her freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year? In the 100 meter and 200 meter. Tiana was the state runner up her junior year for the 100 meter. The Indiana Association of Track and Cross Country named Tiana Brown the 2020 Miss Indiana Track and Field for her senior year. So Tiana is here from Northrop as well as um, the girls head track coach, Terry Milton, if you would come forward, and Northrop principal, Erica Almas. Thank you. 
some pictures, and if mom and dad want to hop up and get some pictures, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Tiana, you told me that you are attending Alabama State Track Scholarship. Great. And you leave Friday. Okay. And um, I think they have an academic program there too, right? So what are you interested in studying? Biology. I'm sorry? Biology, pre-med. Oh, biology. Did you say pre-med? Yes. Awesome. Well, congratulations. Thanks. Hope you're successful both in the classroom and on the... Uh, track. Thank you. We're, lo we're looking forward to hearing great things. <laughs> and feel free to leave. That won't bother us at all. <laughs> <laughs> that was exciting. We haven't had one of those for a while. That's right. That was amazing. So um, next we have um, the consent agenda. And those are items that come to us every meeting. Um, they include the approval of the minutes from our last meeting on July 27th, um, and vouchers and payroll, uh, vouchers for the period ending August 10th, payroll for the period ending July 17th, and the personnel report. Members have seen um, all of these items. So do we have a motion and Move a second? approval of the items listed under the consent agenda, Madam Chair. Second. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Ann. Okay, all those in favor of approval signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Dr. Daniel, was there anything on the personnel report that you wanted to comment on? We can always use more bus drivers. So we have that out there for anyone who's interested in driving buses. As well, we have some assistance, uh, teacher assistance <coughs> that we are in need of. Uh, again, this is usual, but in this year, it's a little bit more unusual. So again, those are items that we wish we could uh, quickly remedy. It appears as though we've hired several new teachers. Yes. So we're... For the district our size, we're looking uh, relatively uh, close to <laughs> meeting that demand. Um, but again, our special needs, specific, uh, there are positions in those areas that we're always in need of, speech therapists and so on and so forth. So again, if anyone is interested, uh, we do have some availability still, but we're hiring. And uh, as you see on your personnel report, a rather significant number. Okay, great. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we have no, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we have no old business, so that brings us to new business, um, and first is the 2021 Adult Education Competitive Grant. It's recommended that the board approve the application for and acceptance of the Adult Education Competitive Grant for 2021 in the amount of $974,359 from the Indiana Department of Workforce Development Division of Adult Career and Technical Education. The 2021 Adult Education Competitive Grant is state funding allocated annually to 12 regions of the state of Indiana. <clears throat> Funds from this grant will allow for the continuation of a range of services for the Fort Wayne Community School District and Allen County Continuing Education Program. The funds in this year's grant are designated for personnel, professional development, instructional materials, supplies, equipment, purchase services, integrated education training, and the Workforce Education Initiative, including workforce certification programming for local Allen County businesses and industry. So the grant includes um, $765,859 for adult basic education, $205,000 for both integrated education and training programs and workforce education initiatives, and then $3,500 for a professional development facilitator stipend. So this is the first year of a competitive multi-grant that runs four years from July 1, 2020 to June 30th, 
<clears throat> so this support services for students 16 of a, years of age and older. And the grant is written by uh, Manager of Continuing Education, uh, Pat Bowles, and supports our district goals one and two. And Mr. Bowles is here to answer any questions. Do we have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Steve. Questions? <laughs> Pat, you want to give us just a little bit of an overview on adult education in the age of COVID? Sure. Uh, just like everybody, uh, it's new norm that we are facing with continuing ed. A lot of different challenges. One of those is the uh, average age in our program is about 36. And with that becomes uh, when you deal with virtual and not uh, native uh, uh, regards to um, the uh, learning of, of technology basis and that. So that's been a challenge. We uh, have been operating all throughout and we have had uh, virtual uh, programming. And uh, actually this summer we uh, had our first ever uh, virtual construction class. Um, and wow. some, of the, some of the challenges that we have faced uh, through this uh, COVID-19 has been the fact that with certifications, as an example with CNAs, uh, we can get the training up until the point of attending like nursing homes and hospitals like patient access, those areas. So our big challenge is, you know, we're not allowed to, to be in those facilities and understandably so. So we are shifting some, uh, we, we continue to focus on advanced manufacturing and healthcare, but uh, we're doing more and more things uh, digitally. Um, prior to, to COVID-19, we uh, had made, uh, we have a five-year technology plan and we have enough laptops uh, that we are able to distribute those uh, during the pandemic to those that needed them. Um, and currently through the process, when you look at, um, I guess positive things through it uh, in adult ed. Number one, generally when the unemployment rate goes up, there's more monies to go for different programmings. And then also with technology things, uh, we've been able to tackle some questions with technology that have, have been out there, but uh, we've not really fully addressed in the state of Indiana. As such, through the process since March, um, we now have online registration for students in any of the programming. We now have um, our, we use an assessment called the test of adult basic ed tape testing and the class E um, testing. Those now both are able to be done online. We've also added the component of which has been really interesting and that has been uh, we now are able to proctor those tests online as well so we literally can have the students on the computers with mirrors cameras etc and be able to proctor those we also have uh, the practice test or skills assessment test uh, the students would take and basically um, those now are online as well the one th piece that we don't have online yet for proctoring purposes would be the actual HSE test, and that's in the works with DRC, which is the, the company that does provide that. And we're hoping that sometime within the next 60 days that uh, we will be able to get that online. That's the one piece that's missing uh, for the, the uh, online registrations and testing piece. So, But we continue to offer our classes. We, like everyone else, have um, kind of uh, modified in dealing with our programming. Our ELL high school students, that's our only full-time program, they are doing the same exact thing that the middle schools and high schools are doing with uh, alternating um, Schedule 1 and Schedule 2, and then every other Wednesday. Our ELL um, literacy groups, uh, because of uh, making sure that our numbers, which were typically large, uh, for the classrooms in language acquisition skills, we now have modified their schedules and s as such and lowered the amount of time that they're in the classes and have some additional classes there uh, so that we can, one, one additional class, so there's really four classes per day that the, the teachers would be uh, having with that. And then we've added some evening classes as well to be able to um, uh, have enough uh, teachers there to uh, provide uh, teaching in that for those individuals. Um, our our um, 
HSE classes. Um, we also um, have those, um, they'll operate, uh, I think it's three days a week and um, three hours a day. And uh, all programs will also have a virtual component. So all programs, uh, students will have the option to either go straight virtual or in person with a hybrid mix where they um, have that. Every year we do offer, uh, we have software programs like with our ELL, we have like Burlington English, we have IXL, we have a number of different um, electronic programming that we offer our students. So when we went into that mo mode in March, students were already involved with that and were able to adapt to that pretty well. And then we added uh, Zoom meetings, uh, Google Classroom, and a number of different uh, activities for those students to participate in. And we still are offering our certification programs as well, um, both the IETs and then the WEIs for our local businesses and so forth. And we're working out the details on those to make sure that we're COVID-19, or COVID-9 um, okay. compliant. Great. Any other questions? I had just one question back, uh, Pat, back to one of your earlier statements about your CNA programs and the inability to provide for the clinical experience. Is there anybody that's come up with a innovative approach to do that? I mean, hospitals practice telemed. So is there some way to provide some experience with patients uh, if not in the same room with them? It's a great question. And one of the things that we've been doing um, as an example, uh, we're entering in um, with some collaboration models within our state. So as an example, Rob Moore, who um, does the continuing ed program in Bloomington, mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna be offering um, some uh, uh, like virtual programming. I know HVAC is one of those. And then we're also gonna offer that here so that we do have different um, uh, certification programs, as you mentioned there, all, you know, live. And, and we're, we're working through that now as far as the different programs. A couple, the main ones that have been difficult to do has been the uh, healthcare ones, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, with the, the state requirements and getting that, that training, right. that's been the roadblock. And, and so we're looking at uh, having some collaborations with other programs to, to be able to, to do that. Okay. Good. <clears throat> Anything else? Okay. Thanks, Pat. Mm -hmm. All those in favor of approval, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. <clears throat> Next, it's um, recommended that the board approve the application for and acceptance of the adult education HSE testing grant <clears throat> in the amount of $9,500. <clears throat> um, the purpose of the 2021 um, Adult Education HSE testing grant is to provide adult students taking HS HSE classes in the state of Indiana to have their HSE testing fees paid through December 31st, 2020. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> I think I have something in my mask. <laughs> this federal grant is part of the CARES Act. This grant will be used to fund the Indiana HSE test fees remittance program to reimburse the Fort Wayne Community Schools continuing education program for adult education student high school equivalency test fees of $90 per test. Do you want me to take over? <coughs> To qualify for this grant, a student must meet two criteria. One, currently enrolled, 12 or more hours in an adult education program, and two, successful scores on the TASC readiness practice exam. The grant is written by the manager of continuing education, Patrick Bowles, and supports Fort Wayne Community Schools District Goal 1, achieve and maintain excellence, and Goal 2, engage parents and the community. And uh, Mr. Bowles is still at the mic if you have any questions. We have a motion and a second. So move. Second. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Maria. <coughs> questions? 
So when students take the HSE test, are they are is continuing ed putting up the money for that up front, or how does that work? <clears throat> uh, the specifics of that will be answered at the state adult ed meeting this Wednesday. Okay. I'm assuming there's going to be some kind of a, a, a voucher uh, type thing that is issued. Um, and basically, it's something that we've looked at before, and uh, it's, I think it's going to be an excellent opportunity for our students to be successful with that. We also received um, just recently a donation in the amount of $2,333.33 from a group that will expand that um, for our minority students in adult ed to pay for their testing come January so that it's not just stopped at that point, but that we are having a, an opportunity to continue with that programming there. But yes, that will be reimbursed by the state for that, those funding. Any other questions? Okay, all those in favor of approval signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Maria, would you like to take the next one? I sure can. Awesome. <laughs> it is recommended that the board approve the application for an acceptance of the adult education integrated English literacy and civic education con competitive grant for the 2020-21 school year in the amount of $150,000 from the Office of the State of Indiana Department of Workforce Development. The purpose of the 2021 Adult Education Integrated English Literacy and Civics Education Competitive Grant is to provide adult English language instruction, integrating all four civics con concepts, naturalization, civic engagement, U.S. history, and government. Funds from this grant will allow for the continuation of a range of services for the FWCS district and the Allen County Continuing <coughs> Education Program for ELL Adult Education Programming. The funds in this year's grant are des designated for personnel, professional development, purchase services, and integrated education and training. This competitive grant, which supports services for adult English language learner students 17 years of age and older, is the first year of the competitive multi-grant that runs for runs for program years sorry <laughs> from july 1 2020 through june 30 of 2024 this grant was written um, by Ms. Bowles, um and this goal uh this supports goals one and two and mr Bowles is still here to answer questions okay we have a motion and a second so moved Second. Thanks, Ann. Thanks, Maria. Yep. So, you service students 16 and older, but for the ELL, this is restricted to 17 and older? Yes, 17 years of age and older. Huh. And how does this amount of money um, compare with what we've gotten in the past? We have, uh, we had requested this year $150,000, which was the amount that we requested last year. Uh, those are the only two years we actually received the total amount of money that we request. Normally in the process you request and then the, 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 the dollar amount settles differently. But um, uh, okay. prior to that, I think it was 120,000 before that, it's, it's continued to go up until the last two years here where we have 150,000. That's also allowed us to, to bring in um, evening uh, ELL classes that we didn't have before. Any other questions? Okay, all those in favor of approval, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Guess that's it for you, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you like to hang around and talk about insurance. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing Pat, he probably could. So next we have renewal of insurance policies. Um, it's recommended that the insurance coverage for boiler and equipment breakdown, property, general liability, inland marine, business, automobile, crime, cyber, and privacy liability, 
educators' legal liability and excess liability be awarded through USI Insurance Services to three underwriting carriers for a premium of $1,086,707. The Cincinnati Insurance Company will underwrite the Boiler Explosion Equipment Breakdown Policy. HSB Specialty Insurance will underwrite the Cyber and Privacy Liability Policy. Right Risk Management will, main, uh, will remain our insurance company for all other policies and the Markle Insurance Company will be the underwriter. Uh, total premiums increased um, $47,729 or about 4.6% with this renewal effective September 1st, 2020. And questions will be addressed by Director of Fiscal Affairs, Stephan Pittenger. Do we have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Thanks, Ann. Thanks, Maria. <clears throat> so is this is this for um, one year? All these policies? Yes. Yes, one year. Mm -hmm. And what is Inland Marine? <laughs> I've asked that question before, and I can't yeah. remember. Yeah. I'm going to have CJ. He's very good at explaining <laughs> that. He's our agent. Uh, <laughs> Super simple. Think of anything that is not a permanently affixed to the building. So the best example I would have for you is sport equipment, musical equipment, chairs, those types of, of things. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. And where did that name come from? I thought maybe we had a yacht that <laughs> Not that I know of. No, no. If we do we've got we've got issues, but no. Or something to do with the pools or something. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to say, I, I, especially right now, I appreciate everything that you guys are doing for the community. I know it's not been easy the last couple months. Um, and so from a leadership perspective, um, I appreciate that. And I also, I, I said this last year, I do think it's important to note your leadership on, on, this, on this side, Kathy Friend, uh, Kim and Stefan routinely get uh, acknowledged high marks from our carriers for their thoroughness, uh, the underwriting that they, that they see. So you've got a fantastic team and it's recognized. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That doesn't surprise me. Um, so all those in favor of approval signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And I will note that um, as we're soon coming into budget season, right, Kathy? that this is a one-year increase of 4.6%. And what's the increase in per student funding that we get for the, this school year, Kathy? I know it's nowhere near 4.6%. It's below 2%, isn't it? Okay, yeah. So once again, you know, these are the type of things that school districts all across the state have to deal with, uh, with increased prices, uh, but the funding from the state does not keep up with inflation. Okay. So next we have the second semester 1920 extracurricular account reports. It's recommended that the board accept the extracurricular account reports for the second semester of the 1920 school year. Indiana code requires an accurate account of all money received and expended by the extracurricular accounts. A report of the sources of all receipts, the purposes for which the money was expended, and the balance on hand is required to be filed with the School Board of Trustees. All extracurricular semester reports were audited by the business office. The general ledger summary report of each school's account is provided. And that is this big, big, that is all 50 schools, correct? And these are maintained for five years and are available for inspection. Questions will be addressed by Chief Financial Officer Kathy Friend. Do we have a motion and a second? So move. Okay. Thanks. Tom and Maria. Maria. Okay. Questions? Is there a grand total on here, Kathy, for all schools? We're just curious. 
Oh, here it is. No, it's not it. <laughs> I think there's a tunnel. No big deal. I'll add it up in my spare time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All the, any, any questions? No. Okay. Um, so all those in favor of approval signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And last item on the agenda is the 2021 board meeting schedule. It's recommended that the board approve the schedule for 2021 board meetings. Meetings are held at 6 p.m. on Monday evenings in the boardroom here in the Grile Administration Building. Um, the dates are the second and fourth Mondays of each month except May, which has three meetings scheduled for um, awards and recognitions. Um, one meeting in April, one meeting in July, and one meeting in December. So, do we have a motion and a second? Move approval, Madam Chair. Second. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Maria. Any questions, comments on the meeting schedule? Okay. All those in favor of approval, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. So that brings us to the close of our uh, business meeting. Uh, well, the close of our business. But um, <clears throat> now we have a report from uh, Superintendent uh, Dr. Mark Daniel on uh, safety in the learning environment. So as we've been experiencing the preparation for the beginning of school, one of the critical factors has been safety in the learning environment. And Mary Hess, our Director of Health and Wellness, will present to you that information and of, of where we are today in that process and uh, where we've been and perhaps even where we're going. So, Is it okay to use the podium? Sure. Please do. Thank you. I'm very grateful for an opportunity to speak with all of you because there's a lot happening right now and a lot of anxiety around everything that's happening. And I'm hoping that the information I give you um, will help with that a little bit. Um, it is the same information that we shared on Thursday for professional learning for all staff. Um, so please feel free to um, let me know if you have any questions with this. Um, the guiding principles or the goals that we were trying to reach with all of these interventions were first and foremost, keep students and sa staff as safe as possible. Um, the second goal is we want to keep our law school and work time at a minimum. And some of the things I'll describe to you this evening, you'll understand exactly why that was a goal. <laughs> and third, of course, is not only to open schools, but to try our best to keep them open so that our kids can have what we need to give them. So those are, um, those are the goals. You can find opinion for almost anything out there right now on COVID, which makes it a very confusing time. Um, but this is a public health crisis and we want everyone to know that we didn't make up any of the rules. We are sticking very close to the public health experts and the guidance that comes from those who are the best at trying to prevent the spread of disease. So of course this is the CDC, the Indiana State Department of Health, um, our local um, health department has been stellar, Allen County uh, Department of Health, of course the IDOE, and the American, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics is on here also because they're experts on children. And we did look hard at their guidance because um, children are our business and we wanted to make sure we were doing the best possible for them. Uh, there is not one person in this district that can carry this on their back and make it work. Um, this is going to have to be a team effort, students, staff, people who come um, to our schools for a variety of reasons. We are all going to have to work together if we're going to have any shot at doing this well. Um, there are some guiding principles that I'm going to discuss because these are the things that we're implementing across the board. It looks like a really simple list, but it, but it just isn't. Um, because what we have to do now is um, 
apply all of the deep learning skills that we've all been um, teaching each other and learning about in the last couple of years and actually apply them to this COVID information, these um, mitigation strategies. It, it's more than just understanding the concepts, but it's applying them and really trying to get behavior change. And anybody that's tried to like lose 10 pounds knows that that's not as easy as it sounds. Um, but we're gonna talk about each one of these, so I'll just go through them. This one probably sounds the easiest, stay home when you're sick, but it, it really is one of the hardest um, and for some very good reasons. We want you to stay home if you're sick, but we also want you to stay home if you um, have been in contact with anybody that's tested positive for COVID. That is first and foremost, because if you're not in our building, you can't infect other people. <laughs> the reason this is so hard is these are teachers we're talking about, and there is not a harder working group of people on the planet. Um, it's against their nature um, to stay home. They feel like they're sloughing off and skimming, and that is absolutely not the case this year. We need everyone to really um, pitch in and stay home if they're sick and work the process to make sure that they're not contagious. Let's see if I can, there we go. Um, this uh, next document is actually something that was shared with us from um, the ISDH and the IDOE, and it's a COVID screening tool aimed at parents, but it's the exact same guidance we would use for staff. And it goes through the COVID-19 symptoms. I'm sure you've all heard the list. It is very long and very broad, and there is there aren't very many acute illnesses that wouldn't be captured by something on this list. Um, usually COVID-19 has multiple symptoms that show up in, in um, the, vic the victims that have it, but honestly, um, we have been instructed by the ISDH that if you have even one of these symptoms, we should apply the guidance for staying home and the rules around that. So coughs and sneeze, sniffles, you know, uh, vomiting, diarrhea. You know, nurses can talk about all those awful things real fast. I hope I'm not mm -hmm. offending anybody. But uh, <clears throat> the most unique one, of course, is loss of taste and smell. Um, that's the one that kind of stands out, but not everybody has it. So um, you don't have to have all. That's the message, just, just one of these. Um, Mary, are we doing um, temperature <clears throat> checks? We are in some cases, but for the most part, what we're asking is parents go through this checklist, including the temperature check, at home. And if children have any of those, they shouldn't come to school at all. That way they're not getting on the bus and, and causing exposure there. Um, you know, it's interesting in, in um, the cases in Allen County, only about 30% of the cases have actually had a temperature. Mm -hmm. So um, while it's one thing that's easy to screen for and it makes, you know, really good photo ops for looking like you're doing a lot, really you have to think about all of them. Um, now there are certain circumstances when we get into what we're doing for um, people who come to the clinic, absolutely no touch thermometers and temperature checks will be done as a screening tool there. Right, so if there's any question, th when those are available and at each building too. We have lots and lots of no touch thermometers um, and we can, we can do that as needed in the building all the time. I always wanna warn people, both students and staff, that if you call in sick, people are gonna ask more questions than they used to. And this isn't because we're trying to be nosy or get into anybody's business, we're just trying to protect the environment. So um, you can expect they're gonna say, do you have any of these symptoms? And if the answer is yes, we are going to tell people you can expect to stay home a minimum of 10 days, but the nurse in the school is going to follow up with you, and this is students and staff alike. It, it would be great if I could just give everyone the summary sheet, and there, there is one. I'll show you in a little bit. But every story that people have, you know, it, it's, it's human, and it takes its ins and outs, and you have to really evaluate the entire picture in order to give um, good guidance on when is the safe return. So uh, here are the, excuse one me. One more question. Sure. So um, if, uh, if um, a staff member or student has one of those symptoms, and so we're telling them to stay home for 10 days, are we 
adjusting they get a COVID test then also? Absolutely. The okay. COVID test in particular helps us identify if they come back positive, who their close contacts may have right. been at school. So it really helps to decrease the, the potential for spread in a building. And that is the big reason for getting the test. People get confused about testing and um, I think probably uh, when you're talking about coming back to school, that's where there becomes the most confusing part. Um, okay. What we tell people is you have to be out a minimum of 10 days mm -hmm. and those last 24 hours you have to be fever free without using Tylenol and your symptoms have to be improving. You could also go to your doctor and get an alternative diagnosis and a release. And that also sounds much easier than it is because that list is so, so big and, and covers so many potential uh, diseases. It's difficult to get a physician to say, I'm absolutely sure this is not COVID, even if the test is negative. But if a person tested negative and their physician said, I also tested them for strep throat, and I'm sure that this is strep throat because I have a test result that proves that, then they would be allowed to return earlier and we would use whatever guidance their physician provides. But in most cases, it's just really hard to know, is it COVID or is it some other viral illness? Okay. So that's good. Okay. This is also the written version of um, all the rules that we're giving to parents and staff. This comes from ISDH and it was distributed through IDOE, but it's pretty much all the things I just told you in written form. Um, I just wanted to make sure everybody did understand it is the nurse who's gonna be calling you and we will go through all of the scenarios. Sometimes it's um, just to give you an example, if a person calls in sick on Monday, they may have really gotten sick Friday night. And so that would change the date that we would give them for the return because it's 10 days from when the symptoms started, not from when they called me. And so um, that's why you just need some help to kind of work through all of, all of the guidance. Mary, would you please uh, inform the board about our staffing of nurses? Yes. Yes, um, I, I would love to tell you about that because we're very fortunate to have additional nursing staff this school year. I think we're gonna need it. And this is a really good example of, of why. Um, I, I've been trying to do most of the case management over the summer and really it's more than a full-time job. Mm -hmm. And when you start thinking about all the students and staff returning, um, that grows exponentially. So we need to have people who understand the rules well in order to make good decisions about this. So we've added eight additional nurses to our team, which gives us a total of 40 school-based nurses. Um, it's excellent staffing. Um, it's about a, a 730 kids to one nurse, which is what the recommendation is nationally. And then we've also added 13 health aides. That's a relatively new position. Um, we started last year having health aides assist the high school nurses who have very high volume clinics. But this year we're expanding this so that if a nurse has a two school assignment, mm -hmm. the health aide would help her cover her, him or her. I, I have to quit saying her because uh -huh. we hired our first male nurse this year. Yay. So yeah, it's great. Um, so I want to say they, um, we want to make sure that, um, you know, they are teamed up with their, their nurse and um, giving the best possible. Advice. That's good that we've got coverage for every school. Yes. The entire Day. I think that will really um, relieve the anxiety of some of our mm -hmm. office staff who have for years really worked hard to try and cover those right. health issues when the nurse isn't present. And so this will be a huge relief because the health aid, while they would be trained very similar to our school secretaries and other mm -hmm. non-medical staff, they are focused on one thing and they're being trained by the nurse. So. Um, our poor secretaries try and multitask quite a little bit, and th this is too much to that, try. Yes, and, that's great. They, yeah. those, those admins, and they've got enough to handle rather than running back to get medications and, you know, that kind of thing. So I'm glad to hear that. It's, it's excellent news. Um, we're very, very close to having a full staff. We have um, all but two of the health aides chosen. And um, I think we just have a couple in the HR process and they mm -hmm. should be done soon. Good. So we're really making progress. 
Next thing is social distancing. This one has also caused a lot of confusion. Is it three feet, six feet, three to six? Who knows, you know? And really the guidance is that from, from the pediatrics experts in particular, that three to six feet is um, safe, they believe, especially in younger children because they don't believe they're quite as infectious. They don't get quite as sick. The adults need to stay back six feet, but the kids themselves can sometimes be three to six. That said, when there is a case, the measuring stick that will be applied to us will be six feet because that's what the health department will use to identify close contacts. So the real message in this is while well, three to six feet is allowable, try to get as much space between kids as you, as you possibly can because it will keep those quarantine groups smaller. This is another one I've been trying to get everyone to really think about um, when you're interacting or doing anything in school right now, and that's try to avoid the close contact. And close contact by definition from the CDC and the health department is that if you are closer than six feet for longer than 15 minutes, you are close contact and at risk of getting sick, but also at risk of getting in quarantine, even if you're not sick. And neither of those things are very good for our school environment. So the, the goal here, again, is stay back six feet all the time. But if you have to go in for something, just keep it brief and keep it under that 15 minute mark. And that really helps. Another strategy here around um, social distancing is cohort groups. And I think especially in the elementary schools where kids are a little closer, this is going to be extremely important, but it's really ex it's important everywhere. So um, you want to make sure you know where kids were so you can you can really confidently answer in a case investigation, yep, I'm sure that's where they were. Because if you're not sure, then the health department is going to err on the side of caution and your quarantine group grows. So if you're sitting in class the same place every day, that will help them determine, okay, maybe only three kids are closer than six feet and not the entire classroom. So that's an important strategy. It applies to the bus. It applies to going out to the playground. It, it applies to everything you do where you move around the building. So the more we know where everyone is, the better. I know it's really rigid, but um, I think it really will cut down and help us meet one of those goals of keeping kids in school wherever possible. Um, masks, face coverings, and shields are another big one. Um, we get lots of questions on this. Um, face masks are what, what are mandated as far as um, our, our state goes. And we are requesting that all students do this, even the younger ones. We realize that they aren't going to be perfect at it. This is something we all have to learn to do. And there will be opportunities for mask breaks when, when kids are socially spaced. Face shields could be important in certain scenarios. All the guidance says that um, face shields probably aren't as protective to others as the mask is. You've all heard the saying, I wear my mask for you, you wear your mask for me. You can't really apply that exactly to a face shield, but it does help and it is better than nothing. Some students with special needs, this may be the only kind of face covering that they would tolerate. Certain lessons that teachers need to provide to students where their lips need to be seen, foreign language, phonics, those things, um, uh, that would, a, a face shield would be appropriate for that. And then we put our face mask on as soon as we could when we were done with that lesson. So um, I, ho I hope that, do you have questions about face masks? I always get a lot of them, but I think people are adjusting. Um, I love this commercial for face masks, and I don't know if you've seen this, but this is on the, from the CDC website, and it was a study that they stumbled upon early on when businesses were starting to open up. So um, this was a, a beauty salon that opened up with two hairdressers, and the hairdressers ended up testing positive. Both of them were infected. Well, when you have a case, what they do is they, they look at when you started to have symptoms, but they actually say you were infectious for two days before that. So you really have to go back 48 hours and think about 
who met that close contact criteria, who was closer than six feet for longer than 15 minutes. And in this particular case, there were 39 patrons in the two days between the two hairdressers. So they had an opportunity, all of them ended up in quarantine, of course, because they met the criteria for close contact, but they followed them through the 14 day period. And the beauty of this is that none of them got sick. And it re it's because they did follow the masking procedures, the hand washing, the disinfecting, all of the things we're trying to implement in school. And it's not as boring as some of the studies that you read on, you know, the research studies that tell you what you should and shouldn't do. I think it's a great illustration for how masking really does protect um, others from the disease. <laughs> Mask breaks, we will have them. And what should they look like? Last week on the ISDH school webinar, um, they gave us some guidance on this because it was pretty vague. The goal is to wear the mask absolutely as much as possible. And how often we take mask breaks, it's gonna be different depending on the circumstance. Um, you know, an elementary that still does not have air conditioning, they probably are going to need more mask breaks than older children that, you know, are in, an, in a, an environment where the air conditioning's on. But when you do it, you should always be socially distant and you should keep it as limited as possible. They recommended five minute breaks and every other student rather than everybody taking them off at once. Sometimes people get the impression that um, if I'm socially distanced, I don't need to wear the mask. But the truth is, is it's socially distanced and the mask that is the gold standard, but if you have to take a break, you only want to do it when you're, when you're far apart. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Hand washing, this is um, uh, something that nurses always care about, but never more important than this year. We've added some additional things to the list besides what we always say, you should always wash your hands or sanitize between before you eat and certainly after using the restroom. But we're also recommending that kids do this um, whenever they enter and leave new spaces because it really does help protect that environment and um, hopefully will prevent the spread of disease. The, the motto we've been using is clean hands in, clean hands out. And um, I think that's probably a pretty good one to live by. Um, I know there's a lot of questions sometimes about handling paper and objects that others have touched. If they're doing it with clean hands, less risk, but certainly when you're done touching them, then you should sanitize, your, clean and sanitize your hands as well. And we have lots of um, hand sanitizer available on and off the bus. They're gonna be doing hand sanitizer. So um, I think we've made huge step forward. Disinfection of frequently touched surfaces is another thing, and it's one of those things we are all going to have to be responsible for because there's no custodian who can do it all every day in every building. We have to be accountable for our, our own space <laughs> and make sure that we are cleaning um, anything that we're going to use in, in our direct space um, before we get in there. And then again, the, sh the shared objects is something we want to make sure we're doing. Mary, how's that going to work in high schools where you have five minutes to well I think they're probably leave. adjusting time some but um, the theory true? passing period time still five minutes still five minutes okay. so they're gonna have to arrange it as they're creating their plans which they're still working on those okay. yeah um, and the numbers seem to be or seem to see a more migration towards 100% um, remote so again, that's good news in the six through 12 environment, mm -hmm. um, but it still creates uh, the need to ensure that we're trying to clean. So that will, pot, that will most likely, well, it has to be, and, and I've spent, I've been in five buildings today, and I can say that in each building, they're working through their systems of how to create this, this cleaning aspect. Um, and some, they're, they're varying, so just depends. Um, but I was also pleased to hear that they are continuing to have that discussion with their teachers, with their staff. Some had it last week, some are waiting for tomorrow. Um, again, it's an it's evolving process. So we'll see how that works. However, every room will have a dispenser. So if you can't wash your hands, you need to use at mm -hmm. least the disinfectant. Right. 
Now I know Darren mentioned also that um, I think in the secondary in particular with all the changing of classes, if they spray, if the teacher sprays as they leave, by the time they come back that their product might have evaporated. Um, if you're sitting in the class, you have, I know you have to leave it on for a minute and then wipe with a to paper towel. And then of course, anytime you clean, you wash your hands afterwards, mm -hmm. so. Okay, all righty. Um, I think it, your questions illustrate my point from the beginning. Um, we have to apply all of these strategies in some pretty unique ways depending on what our workspace and our job looks like. Um, but I've just challenged everybody, and I, I know they've taken this so seriously, is when you're doing something, evaluate the risks, and then ask yourself, is this is this activity absolutely necessary? And if it is, then you have to ask yourself, how can I make this safer? And it's by implementing all of these, these things. Illness at school, we've gotten a lot of questions about this. Um, and, and I expect that we will be sending more students home from school than we usually do. It's very counterintuitive for school nurses to do that because we love to keep people in school. But this year we probably will be asking parents to come quickly. Um, we will be keeping kids that have symptoms that could be COVID separate from the other, other kids and we have asked schools to identify an isolation space um, which I know sounds really scary but basically we're just keeping them separate from others until their parents come um, so that's all that really is um, this is just a list of clinic rules and I can summarize for you here um, I've shared this with um, the buildings but we really do need to think about um, our regular school clinic because we have a lot of children who come there for things that have nothing to do with illness they come for medications they come for their diabetes care and their inhaler and all all of that mm -hmm. and so that clinic space has to be clean and this is where we will be doing temperature screening automatically for every everyone who comes. So the nurse would have a waiting area outside the clinic, check a temp before they enter, um, check for symptoms. If they have them, they would go to the isolation area. And if not, then they would come in for their routine things. Um, there are some in-betweens. The best example I can give you is around <laughs> asthma. If a child came down short of breath, one of the things on the COVID list, right? Um, but I know you have asthma and I have your inhaler. You don't have a fever or any other symptoms. I'm letting you in, I'm using your inhaler. I'm going to let you rest in the clean space. And if you're better, then I'm going to send you back to class. But if you don't get better, then we would have to think about the COVID symptoms and move on there. We're going to be working with our teachers and ask them to really try and slow like that pace down to the clinic because we do see a lot of kids. Um, and I have a little algorithm on this next thing um, for you. We want to see anybody that they think is having symptoms right away or anybody that they think um, you know, is injured beyond a Band-Aid that they could possibly give them in the classroom, uh, we wanna see those kids right away. And anybody who's having a symptom from their chronic illness, we need to know about that. Um, we certainly want our routine kids to come down as scheduled so that we don't get behind in their care. But then there's this gray area where sometimes kids just need to um, have a consultation with the nurse. Um, perhaps there's a rash that itches and bothers me, but I'm not sitting close to anybody these days, so it probably can wait until there's a, a free moment and we're asking them to call us um, in advance and um, you know come and see us then. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about what does happen when there is a positive COVID case. Um, we, again, do not make up these rules at all. We go directly to the people in charge of um, keeping public health and safety in Allen County and the Allen County Health Department will direct us on each case. They will identify the close contacts, and again, those are those people closer than six feet, longer than 15 minutes, for two days before the person got infectious. And here is the real commercial for those seating charts I was talking you about, to you about. It's not very often that we get a fast COVID re test result. There are a few ways you can get it, but they are not readily available. So most of the time, the COVID positive 
result comes three or four days after I've sent you home sick. So now I'm asking you, remember last Wednesday? Do you remember who was close to this person? And it gets really hard to do unless you're consistent with a chart. So um, that's what will happen. Um, we will notify um, any close contacts and they will be required to stay out of school for a 14 day period. And that's the period of quarantine. You start that from the last day they were with them. So sometimes kids could be in school for four or five days and then we'll go back and say, well, now you only have nine days left, but you still have to do it. Um, people get confused on this one a lot because it seems counterintuitive that I send the well person home for 14 days, but the sick person can come back in 10, and there's nothing fair about that. Um, but the truth is um, that's just the course of the illness for COVID if you're mm -hmm. sick, and that's how long you can get sick after being exposed. So it's just applying science. And that's that's oh, all there is. Mary, do do our nurses have um, you know lists of where COVID testing can be um, obtained so that we can give that information to people that we call? We do. Okay. Um, uh, actually, the Indiana State Department of Health has a very nice um, web page for this. Um, if you look at Allen County, it gives you all the different locations. Right. But and I there mean, is a free site in Allen County. You know, Allen you're County. always going to get asked that question. Yes. I mean, oh, hopefully you've got that information right there to give and it to them if they ask. I do. And they add them and they move them. So it's really good that they have mm -hmm. a web page because right. it doesn't stay the same. Um, isolation and quarantine, I think I already explained the difference, but isolation is for sick people. That's the 10 day, or, or somebody that um, tests positive. Every once in a while we'll run into someone that gets a test for whatever reason. They've had zero symptoms, but now they're positive. So they also go into isolation just like the sick people, and that's the 10 day period. Quarantine is for people who've been exposed and are well, and we're just, they're the watched pot. We're waiting to see if they get, um, get any symptoms. So will, will school close if there's a case of COVID? And that is, the, that is the million dollar question. And there's so many factors that go into this, it's hard to tell you exactly for sure. CDC says that schools can expect to close for two to five days when there's a case identified. Um, that's because I think they, that maybe they didn't know how great we could do it here at FWCS. I will say we have had some positive cases and we have not had to close buildings as a result because we've gotten very good at um, following the rules with distancing and we're able to answer the questions the health department has quickly because that two to five days is about cleaning and about identifying who has to stay home. And if you, the quicker you can do that, um, the less time school has to be closed. I don't know what that will look like once school is in session because that's a lot of people, but I think we um, have all the components to make that be as short as possible. Uh, um, Mary, yeah, and maybe you're gonna cover this later, but so do we have um, metrics that were, I'm sure we have a lot of metrics that we're following, but do we have any metrics in particular that we're following to, um, evaluate whether um, the district should be closed or whether you know a building should be closed or that sort of thing. Some counties in Indiana have implemented those. I know um, Marion, St. Joe County in particular, mm -hmm. and I know it's something that's being looked at very hard in Allen County right now. And what's um, Marion County, remind me, what's Marion County doing? Um, Marion County, I think if you- I know they're all- More than 10%. Remote. Um, okay. Of a community spread, I think they're closing school. Positivity rate. And what they usually look at for these things are seven day rolling averages. Because if you, if you watch right. the COVID website, and I do every day, I don't know if all of you have to, but it goes up and down quite a little bit. So that rolling average is really uh, important information. And you know, we're watching the cases in Indiana, Indiana and Allen County closely right now, so. I thought I would give you a couple of examples here um, of some scenarios, and I have to give Mindy Waldron, Erica Pritchard um, the credit here because they're the ones who actually put this together for schools when we were trying to determine what is the best course. And, and, and you've heard me just you know tell you all of this information in a very short period of time, but it's a lot to digest. And trying, it, 
I think going through the scenarios helps you understand why we've done some of the things that we've done um, to keep those um, case numbers down. So scenario one is, um, this is a secondary one, a secondary teacher tests positive. Uh, she only teaches math in one classroom. She worked for two days while infectious. So okay, um, what do we need to worry about with this person? And really, you want to um, know that it's little print on here, but um, the students um, all wear masks when they're in between classes. They take mask breaks when they're socially distanced in class, but they're brief. Um, when students arrive, the teacher stays six feet back from them. She greets them from afar. Uh, the desks in her classroom are all, all spaced six feet apart. Um, the teacher leaves her mask on when she's teaching um, in this particular scenario. All of those things are relatively low risk and because of the spacing, there's nobody in that classroom that would probably end up in a quarantine group, which is a really, really good thing to have happen. Um, she does have a couple of chats with students one-on-one -on -one who are struggling with work. But um, the key here is if she kept them under 15 minutes, again, no reason to quarantine any of the students. Um, they also want to know, was she with other people in the building? And well, what she does is um, she goes to the restroom, but when she does that, she wears her mask. She eats her lunch in her classroom. Um, she doesn't let people walk around when people are eating lunch. She did have one conversation at her car, and this is the kind of thing that probably is mo most likely to really get us, but she goes to her car and um, she has a long discussion with someone for about 20 minutes. They were physically close and didn't have their masks on, and that person likely would end up in quarantine. Uh, but the real question is, would we have to close school in this sort of scenario? And the answer is probably not, as long as we could give the information quickly. We may have to do some additional cleaning. Cleaning is also um, dependent on many things. And one of them is the timeline of when we find out. You know, early on we were thinking it was, COVID was going to live on surfaces for, you know, months. But really, if we get much past 48 to 72 hours, they really aren't asking us to do a lot of extra cleaning as long as our routine practices are good. And I think that um, our facilities and Sodexo team have done an excellent job of putting very good um, things in place. So probably not gonna have to close school in this in instance. Um, we probably wouldn't even have to notify everybody. And I know that people worry about that a lot. Um, the rule of thumb here is if you weren't notified, then you weren't identified as a close contact and it's not necessary. Some scenarios are a little less clear and it's possible we would want to tell everybody while we are expecting you to self-monitor every day, we want you to pay extra, extra close attention to this so we're notifying you that there was a case, but you don't have to do anything different than what you do every day. This is just an elementary one, very similar, and I'll kind of go through this um, even quicker. The difference in this scenario is that they did ride a bus um, to and from, from school. There were two kids on each seat. They wore their masks. They loaded the bus from back to front to try and keep that from stirring things up and people passing each other all the time. And um, they did a really good job with their, with their masks and such. So um, the bus driver stays away from everybody. So all of these things are fairly low risk. The kids on the bus, if there is a seating chart, um, only the kids within six feet would have to be quarantined and everybody else would probably be okay, including the driver, which we want to preserve our staff as much as possible. Um, was he with other students? In our elementary schools, there could be situations where kids are a little closer than six feet, so it's possible there would be a group of students there that might end up in quarantine. Um, but as long as... Um, they're, they're following all the practices in the classroom. It would not necessarily include the whole class. Um, in this scenario, also these kids went to PE class. They stayed socially spaced when they were in there. Um, this particular PE teacher was uh, supposedly 
closer than six feet for longer than 15 minutes uh, because he kind of forgot himself. And so that person would end up in quarantine. But again, not a scenario where the school would be closed. Um, if we had to do extra cleaning, and that's part of the guidance we get from the health department initially when they evaluate the entire situation, we would do that. It just depends on the situation. And we would notify people and hopefully be able to keep our doors open. I did want to mention um, this cross system, and um, this is new to Allen County um, this week, and it's specifically for school um, reports of COVID. So um, there are people who, who are being trained. In fact, our training at FWCS is happening tomorrow, but we'll be responsible for entering the close context and the specifics of a case. The nurses at the building will probably gather the specifics and the health and wellness team will put them in. The health department will call us within an hour to give us advice. Um, to be honest, they've been quicker than that to date. So I don't know, um, but they, they expect a lot more cases, um, which probably will happen when we have so many people back at school. That was a lot of info, but I wanted to t make sure you knew what staff was being told and um, if you have questions or you think of them later, I'm always willing to try my best. So help. Mary, what Mary. is the Allen County seven day rolling average positivity rate right now? Um, last Friday was the last time I spoke with Mindy about it. I think it was the last time it was calculated and it was at 40, which is pretty high for us when is you it, look it was at what? 40 cases um, per day. It was oh. the seven day rolling average. And um, that does kind of put us at risk. Got they, a tornado they, warning. Tornado warning? Yes. Yeah, there is a uh, tornado ah. warning. What is security asking us to do? Yeah, for until 745. So. All right. We're all going to head down side, downstairs and socially distance. So um, <laughs> what do we do, David? Do we adjourn or do we just? We can just postpone the meeting and then resume, or do you want to adjourn? Thanks all the time. Um, you know, I think we should just adjourn. I know we've got a couple people here who stuck around to um, speak to us, but if you come into the basement, you can speak to us there. Okay? So, do we have a motion? Thank you, Mary. You're so welcome. moved. Second. That's a motion for adjournment. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. We're heading to the basement. <laughs>